Good morning or good afternoon from wherever you are at. Today is our presentation is about tales of cloud compromise, threat landscape, incidents, and learnings. We are Mandiant, part of now Google Cloud. My name is Nader Zaveri. I'm a senior manager with Mandiant, uh, now part of Google Cloud. Hi, folks. This is Will Silverstone, my senior consultant at Mandiant. Hey, folks. And I'm Omar Leth, and I'm a principal consultant at Mandiant. Okay, so a little bit of background of what this presentation is about. What we've noticed is organizations are starting to make uh, their migration strategy, starting to migrate critical workloads into the cloud. And this is really what we started to see been exacerbated whenever the pandemic happened. So we started seeing a, even a expedited approach into the cloud. However, one big thing that we notice is their security mindset, the way they implemented security was almost a lift and shift similar to how they were going into the cloud. And what happened is that started to blur the lines between on-prem and cloud environments, which then got into one of the big things that we always talk about is identity is now the new perimeter. That then has to change your approach to how you secure identities. And now when you're in the cloud, another thing that happens is your, ex your attack service has now extended. So how can we reduce that? Google Cloud took a survey, uh, and this is something that is probably not uh, so surprising, but we surveyed uh, organizations who did their journey from uh, migrating on-prem into the cloud. And what we notice is the majority of organizations, 63%, uh, had either the exact same strategy or had mostly the same strategy when they are performing and implementing security, security in the cloud. And with just a few, you know, minor percent of folks around tw less than 20% that said they would have a completely different approach or mostly different approach into the cloud. And this is kind of uh, something that we can see when we're performing incident response on a lot of organizations. This is something we see uh, just by the pure implementation of security when we are performing our incident response investigations. So that gets into what we want to talk about. As I mentioned, the three major things we we want to kind of focus our presentation on is one around hybrid architecture, understanding your hybrid architecture, understanding your on-prem architecture and your cloud architecture and where they meet. Secondly, we want to talk about securing your identities. As I mentioned, identity is the new perimeter. It is the most important thing when it comes to cloud security. And thirdly, how can we reduce our attack surfer? As I mentioned, when we get into uh, the cloud, that has now extended our attack surfer. How can we reduce it as much as possible? And throughout the entire process, we're going to be talking about logging, detection, response, through uh, similar to how when you have a zero trust model, that logging is uh, throughout the entire process. A little bit of housekeeping items. Uh, we're going to be going through a lot of case studies, a lot of actual real life incidents. What we try to do is take the overarching narrative of the incident and try to obfuscate a lot of the specific minute data points, just so that doesn't get uh, you know pointed back to a client of ours. We are very particular about keeping our clients' uh, incidents very close to our chest. So we will be talking about case studies. These are real life case studies, but we're going to try to obfuscate and try to still keep the the whole crux of the matter still there. All right. Yeah. And so we'll talk about the first kind of main area of focus here around hybrid integrations. And so we'll start off with kind of some of the key challenges that we're seeing organizations face. And so when we come into, you know, incident response engagements or doing kind of proactive assessments, we're very often seeing organizations are starting to deploy that kind of critical tier zero infrastructure, uh, domain controllers, PKI servers, PAM servers into their cloud environments. And so it's important to understand that when you deploy that and a critical infrastructure that can control your on-premise environment, when you deploy that into the cloud, the security of your you know, on-premise and your cloud environments are now tied to one another. So a compromise in the cloud can then you know, allow an attacker to move into your on-premise environment and vice versa, and, you know, a, your cloud environment is now at risk if your on-premise environment is compromised. And so some of that comes into you know, accounting for within the cloud, the control plane versus the data plane in terms of securing 
your cloud infrastructure at both kind of the administrative console and then also at the resource level. Uh, and then the second point around kind of privilege escalation and lateral movement, thinking about, you know, if you're responsible for securing a cloud environment, what are those paths that an attacker might be able to take to kind of get in the back door from an on-premise perspective? So if we're securing all of, you know, identity and everything from the cloud perspective, what are those lateral movement and privilege escalation paths from your on-premise environment? And so we'll get into the first incident response case study that kind of shows how an attacker can move from on-premise to the cloud, and in this case, deploy ransomware into the cloud environment. And so in this specific scenario, uh, the organization had an on-premise data center, they had a, a cloud environment. And so what we saw in this attack was an attacker was able to exploit an exchange vulnerability, exfiltrate emails from the organization, and actually sell those emails to a second uh, attacker group who were able to use those to craft highly targeted phishing campaigns towards administrators of the organization. And because these were highly targeted and, and utilized data stolen from the, from the organization, a number of administrators fell for the phishing. The, the attacker was able to get malware installed in endpoints, admin credentials, get onto the VPN, and eventually move laterally to a domain controller. Once there, uh, you know, fairly common attack technique using a GPO to deploy ransomware within the Active Directory domain. Uh, but what was unique about this one is that the organization had virtual machines deployed in their cloud environment that were domain joined to the Active Directory on-prem. And so there was nothing preventing that ransomware from spreading from the on-premise Active Directory into the cloud environment. And I think it's important to note here, this is very often the case when we think about ransomware in the cloud that there's very often that on-premise component where it's, it's a weakness on-prem that allows that ransomware to spread into the cloud environment. And so let's finish off with just some key takeaways from this, you know, first off around securing that tier zero infrastructure within your cloud, uh, kind of thinking about that control plane versus the data plane if you're deploying, you know, domain controllers into your cloud environment, you know, thinking about the full picture of who has access to that virtual machine, both from, you know, the privileges from Active Directory, but also from who can access it just from the cloud, you know, admin console. And one good way of kind of accounting for that would be if you're deploying that, you know, critical infrastructure, making sure it's properly isolated within your cloud environment. So maybe in, in Azure having a dedicated management group or in AWS having a dedicated account where that would be stored to limit, you know, who has access to those. And then properly segmenting cloud and on-prem. So thinking about the example where, you know, ransomware is able to spread from the on-premise into the cloud, understanding that, you know, those basic uh, on-premise security best practices still apply in the cloud. So, you know, not allowing outbound network connection where it's not required, things like that. And then lastly, just touching on, you know, the logging component of it. Uh, a lot of the times when we come into, you know, cloud-based incident response, the logs that are required to do in full investigation aren't necessarily enabled by default. So those, those are kind of those data plane logs, those you know, firewall logs, database access logs, uh, compute access logs, things like that. So making sure that we're going down the list of the logs that can be enabled, making sure we're enabling those, centralizing them and have the ability to you know, correlate between on-premise and cloud-based logs. And so with that, I'll pass it back over to Omar to talk about the next section around identity. Awesome, thank you, Will. Before we get into identity, really to, to kind of set the stage, when we look at cloud environments as the borderline is your identity, if we look at statistics and if we look at historical cloud incidents, the majority of those incidents originate because of some sort of an identity misconfiguration. And that can be uh, weak to no passwords, uh, accounts, credentials that have been leaked, et cetera. So when we, when we think of common misconfigurations as it relates to identity, generally speaking, the, the first one is that organizations are using their on-prem identity store, commonly Active Directory, to manage and administer cloud environments. And that's really kind of the, the hybrid architecture that we'll touch on. The second main thing is uh, a lot of organizations move fast to cloud environments and they've defaulted to using the default roles across all major cloud service providers. So you look at AWS and the, there's an excessive use of administrator role in Azure global administrator and in GCP, the use of basic roles. 
Third is the use of day-to-day -day endpoints to manage and administer cloud environments. And that also touches on the same topic as the fourth bullet point, where a lot of organizations are using the standard default laptop and account that's being provided to end users. And those end users are using those endpoints and accounts to access HR applications, access uh, news outlets, probably even social media. And at the same time, they're using those accounts and endpoints to manage and administer cloud environments. And then the last piece that we commonly see is a common challenge across our clients is weak or limited MFA enforcement. Uh, think of not enforcing multi-factor authentication across the board, but then also in some cases, enforcing weak multi-factor authentication methods. Think of SMS, phone call, et cetera. These are just weak MFA methods that now threat actors have tactics, have techniques to bypass and gain access across these methods. The last piece on MFA is really on the registration and visibility. So making sure that we've restricted uh, who and from where a user or an admin can register an MFA method, but then at the same time, does the organization have full visibility into the MFA process, MFA modifications, et cetera? So we'll, we'll go through a case study, just similar to what we went through in hybrid architecture, but in here, we'll see how a threat actor was able to abuse an identity that was compromised on-prem to gain access and exfiltrate data from a cloud environment. So in this case, uh, the attacker is an APT group, Advanced Persistent Threat Actor. Those are nation state sponsored threat actors, highly technical in nature. And in this case, they use some stolen credentials to log into VPN. Once they've got access to on-prem, they started installing remote access tools. It's a common attack technique to maintain persistence within an infrastructure. The third step, once they've connected to the network and they were able to kind of maintain persistence, is they were threat actor was able to move laterally to a domain controller, get access to the DC, and dump the Active Directory database, also known as the NTDS .dit. Once they dumped the Active Directory database, they exfiltrated that, came back within a period of 24 hours, and they got credentials that they've compromised from the Active Directory database and used those credentials to log into a cloud environment. In this case, it was Azure Active Directory or Entra ID. Once they've logged in, the account they used was actually a global administrator account. That's the highest privileged account within the Azure ecosystem. And they used that account to perform some reconnaissance, understand the lay of the land, understand what security configurations that organization has enforced, and then they modified some settings to allow themselves to exfiltrate highly sensitive files and folders the organization was storing within SharePoint. So when we look at this case and when we look at the common misconfigurations that we see as it relates to identity, what are some tactical and targeted takeaways? The first takeaway is really around this kind of separating our identities. Accounts that are privileged should not should be separate from your daily driver account. And second, accounts that are privileged in the cloud should stay in the cloud and not be synced back to on-prem and vice versa. Two is implementing just-in-time check-in, check-out access model. Administrators do not need to be admin over the weekend, over when they're on PTO, or even after shift. Access should be provided for a finite duration of period of time where they need to perform administrative functions only. And right now, a lot of cloud service providers are offering a PIM-like functionality that provides you the ability to provide only just, just in time access to your administrators. When we look at number three is restricting what endpoints our administrators are allowed to use to perform administrative functions, similar to what we will be doing with identity, which is the separation and segregation of our identities. We want to apply that same model across our endpoints by requiring administrators to use privileged access workstations that are hardened, restricted, and we have higher level of visibility across what is executing, what's being performed on those privileged access workstations. And the last key takeaway over here is enforcing strong phishing resistant multi-factor authentication. Think of FIDO2 keys. Uh, these are a great example of strong and phishing resistant MFA methods. But also we don't wanna forget about restricting the MFA kind of process uh, entirely. So from where a user can register or modify their MFA settings, a common, uh, technique that we deploy with our clients is to restrict MFA registration and modification to trusted networks. So end users have to physically show up within a trusted network and only from there, they're allowed to modify or add a net new MFA method. And with that, I'll hand it over to Nader to walk us through our third 
section, a section. Nader. Thank you, Will and Omar. So we've talked about uh, securing your identities. We've talked about understanding your hybrid architecture. This right here we're going to talk about is how your attack surface gets extended and how can we reduce the attack surface. Really, there's two big things. One is what we've seen is publicly exposed resources throughout the time uh, that we're performing cloud-based incident responses. This is like the bulk of a lot of our incident response engagements. These are publicly exposed virtual machines or EC2 instances through via virtual networks or publicly exposed buckets like S3 buckets, storage buckets, or even Kubernetes services that are publicly exposed. And with that, we're starting to see a sprawl of keys and credentials. As I mentioned, identity is the new perimeter. So utilizing keys such as service accounts or long-lived credentials are what we're seeing in the cloud where we're seeing that they're putting on public uh, code repositories, SharePoint sites, uh, Google Drives. This is where a lot of your uh, keys live and threat actors know this. So this is where they're attacking. So it might not be publicly exposed, but once they're in an environment, these are the areas they try to go after because they know additional uh, identities are there so they can help maintain persistence or even escalate their privilege. So we want to get into a specific case study. With this case study, a organization creates a, a GCP service account uh, with owner permissions created. And that is then the organization, one of the people in the organization had a publicly inadvertently created the public key and put it in their uh, public repository and that went public. Within two minutes though, GCP Security Command Center alerted the organization that, hey, your key is now in a public sphere. You want to try to mitigate that. So within two minutes, uh, they did get an alert. Uh, the organization was not able to catch that. And within 12 hours, a threat actor was able to get in the environment. And once they got in the environment, one thing I will uh, pause right here is with cloud incidents, things happen at a lot quicker rate than in on-prem incidents. So as soon as the attacker got in the environment, they started, they had a very clear goal. What they wanted to do was they wanted to, uh, they performed around 2,000 API requests with two main purposes. One purpose is to create a NAT, router so then that can be internet capability as well as then create a virtual machine in that net router that can have publicly accessible and within each region so throughout the entire process they're creating this uh with uh, so quickly so then they can have their uh externally facing virtual machines the organization did not see this. So this entire time, they had this SCC command center alert sitting in their alerts. They never checked it. Fast forward a couple of uh, weeks later, about 10 days later, they get a bill, and now they have an extremely high bill. And this is not the first time that this happens, where the the organization gets alerted by a high high bill. They see that this bill is very high, and that's when they kick off the investigation. Uh, even though there's been many points in time where they could have definitely, uh, you know, been able to remediate this. So that gets into what are some of the major takeaways from this. The first major takeaway is determining whether there are long-lived credentials. As I mentioned, that service account uh, with owner permissions, where, if that is that necessary, and if it is, where is that happening? How can we try to create compensating controls to block that? And two is you want to keep an inventory of this, uh, similar to how service accounts are created and how you want to keep an inventory of service accounts on premises. Similarly, you want to do uh, that same type of uh, methodology for inventory. And you also want to monitor for exposed keys. As I mentioned, uh, organizations like Azure, AWS, Google, they all create an alert whenever keys are exposed. And sometimes those alerts happen really quickly. It is a matter on an organization to be able to take that alert and bring it up and try to prioritize that to be able to remediate right away. As I mentioned in this, pre in this example, they had the chance to do it right away, but it, uh, within 12 hours, a threat actor was able to get in. And then you want to continuously monitor your attack surface, not only from a vulnerability side, right? That's, you know, your vulnerability management side, but also from a misconfiguration, 
right? Because a vulnerability management won't see if your bucket is publicly exposed. That is not a vulnerability. That is a, a misconfiguration. So you want to ensure that your attack service, when you're looking at your attack service, is not just focusing on vulnerabilities, but also looking at uh, misconfigurations and seeing if you're starting to see a lot of public IPs. Uh, spin up within your attack surface. And that's something that happened with this client right here. And with that, wanted to kind of recap what, what the things that we've talked about, right? Number one, focus on your hybrid architecture, your on-prem to cloud uh, architecture and how that's being integrated. Number two, securing and segmenting your identities. And number three, understanding your attack surface, both from a networking side as well as an identity side. And that right there, thank you so much for listening to us and have a great day.